Our next speaker is Mr. Jesper Palmquist. Mr. Palmquist is the Area Director Asia Pacific for STR and he would be delivering a presentation on the topic Data Digest, Analyzing Demand, Supply and Performance in the Maldives and Beyond. There we go. Can you hear me? Is everything all right? Excellent. Uh, is it morning still? It is, by a few minutes. Good morning, everyone. And first of all, thank you for having us here. And thank you for this amazing turnout. I think it's really impressive. Thank you to Mr. Mamdu and, and everyone for organizing this event. Uh, it's critical for any country, <clears throat> and I would argue particularly for Maldives, to do this as often as possible, to get everyone together, get that communication between all of you, the various stakeholders that drive the Maldives uh, forward. And I could listen to your stories, Mr. Evie, for all day about in the beginning. I was just soaking it up. That's fantastic stories. The Morse code and everything. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, beats uh, most things I've heard around the world, to be honest. That's fantastic. The way you've built it up from uh, being just unrecognized and not known to where it is today is, is quite miraculous. So I am very grateful to be here today. And uh, from an STR perspective, I will... Uh, run through a lot of data points, talk about data, the trends, what we're seeing, we present a lot around the world, um, and my name is Jesper and I'm based in Singapore, uh, that's our regional hub, uh, we're uh, around the world, uh, my colleague Jasmita, are you in the room somewhere, if you stand up, so Jasmita is working with South and Central Asia based in Bombay, so she's also around here to talk about these data points uh, throughout this week. Uh, we've been very privileged to work with a lot of Maldivian hotels for up to 20 years uh, and more for every year that follows. Uh, but very quickly, in terms of what STR, we, we do benchmarking and data intelligence pretty much. And there are many of, many of you who already look at that. STR is one of all those systems and one of all those data points that you either look at or should look at uh, in order to grow the business. Um, we've become an industry standard in that benchmarking because we've been around since 1985. Um, started in the US and then grew up outside the world. International brands first and then local and more independent hotels. And it's really about, we get the data from the hotels and then we are trusted to provide an uh, independent benchmark, the star report in return. So people compare with a, a trusted neutral source for what you can, uh, how your business is performing in general. And a lot of hotels now are starting to look beyond, of course, in the last few years, beyond the rev part. We also do P&L uh, surveys, and people can look at the GOP part, the total rev part. And there's more around the net rev part, of course, as well. And then pipeline and, and, and forecasting as well. That sound is not me, fortunately. Now, so we, we, we're here this week, and I think it's a fantastic opportunity for us to talk to you about these trends. We present a lot around the world in various markets, and a lot around last year was change around the world, what's happening. There's a lot of um, outer effects, political, economical things that affect our tourism industry in the Maldives and beyond. So it could be your economical, people talk about banking crisis, we talk about the volatility in exchange rates, and in India the demonetization, we've got a lot of publicity of course, and how does that influence domestic tourism and F&B primarily but also about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Will there be a replacement? Will China step in or not? And, and do with that and Brexit effects. And right now, it's about the French election. Where is that going to leave Europe and the European Union? So there's so much change going on. And also you had uh, the Zika virus last year and H1N1 and all those factors. It's in the news every day and it makes people go like, it, it's a horrible word. And terrorism, everything is going to go really bad. Because we also have these days uh, a number of leaders that some have been around a long time, some are new. Um, so the leaders of some of the biggest economies <coughs> have a slightly different view and a different tone, if I say that politically correct. So there is a, there's a change in the last couple of years and people are afraid and investors are starting to look like which markets are really safe if you're not an opportunistic investor. So what's interesting, of course, is tourism is still growing. The good news is that UNWTO and the World Tourism and, and Travel Council still report that tourism is growing and travel in general. And intra-Asian travel is growing some of the fastest in the world. 
So the good news is that the industry we're in keeps feeding. It keeps growing. And if we build for the future, uh, like the Maldives have done around these markets in Sri Lanka and other markets around, there is a good uh, future ahead. And of course, the, the good news here in, in the Maldives is that currency fluctuation is a big topic in many countries, not so much here. We know that you look at the Brexit example, travel from uh, Britain still grew quite well, regardless of their currency uh, losing value. And people who go here are less sensitive to that. And then, of course, the exchange rate has been pretty fixed and locked down for, for six years, both against the renminbi and the, and the dollar. So uh, exchange rates we don't have to talk about, which is kind of nice, because in a lot of markets we spend a lot of time around that. So let's jump into that arrival scenario. And I think it's really uh, impressive and, and the, that important diversification that has been happening on the source markets. Because we all know that after that bump, there were fewer Chinese people coming last year. So everyone's seen those numbers, and after that peak, it went down a bit. But, and even if this is a small graph for you guys in the back, if you see it there, but in the top 10, then after China, it was really only Russia and France that declined in the last few years. Everyone else in that grew. So that's good, right? So when there's 25% now of people from China coming, that the other nations are growing, and if we go beyond that and go to the 10 to 20, and I, I chose to do top 20 because the 19 and 20 are my two countries, Singapore where I live, and I'm from Sweden, so I had to bring that in because I'm, I'm very proud of that, clearly. But again, here you had only two countries that declined. Only two countries that declined over the years. So about 50 out of 20 are growing. So all those behind that Chinese decline, you have growth. And that diversifi diversification is clearly important with the new airport, with all those keys that are coming around the country, it needs to come from a wider source of sources and a, a wider uh, new clients that not only want to come and tick Maldives off a bucket list, but they want to be a return customer, of course. So that was quite impressive. And people talk about the length of stay, of course, and, and a lot of the times when I've presented around the world has been, yeah, it's been declining and those numbers are clear, but that has also evened out. So now we've seen it there around five and a half, and with the decline of the Chinese, that stay, what is it, four, four, four and a half max, right? The Chinese customer on average, it, it's leveled out a bit. So that length of stay seems to have at least stopped where it is right now um, compared to uh, the, what's been happening before. So let's dive into the performance numbers and see what's been happening uh, in the last few years because. <coughs> How cyclical is the Maldives? Well, maybe less than someone like Phuket and, and Thailand as a whole or, or other arguably competing markets in, in that sense. So if we look at the longer view, um, the interesting part is this, right? So we see in all this squibbly how the red par has been trending in the last few years, there was 20 months of positive growth and really strong growth in the beginning. So that's a counter effect of the negative year of a year effect. The 20 months, which was followed then by, most recently, 22 months of negative growth. There's a little bit of an uptick at the end there that we know in the last few months as well. But if you look at the last, the last seven years, in the occupancy, you can see it's a big gap, 10%. 10% is a big jump down from where we, uh, we saw it at the, at the peak there, down from 72 to 62 in general. Um, rates holding up reasonably well. Clearly, there's a, there's a drop in it, but compared to other markets where this kind of demand drop happened, this was not bad. So in comparison to other markets around the world, I would say Maldives actually held up not best in class, so not Thailand and arguably these days Indonesia, but reasonably well, held up pretty well. As a result, as you can see, the red par uh, took a hit in the last couple of years and went down, and we're now back at 2011 levels. So I think that's a, a bit of a wake-up call when people are saying this is coming through the last few years when, yeah, there's been some additional supply, but we'll get back to supply later. As we've already been mentioned, um, all these new keys that are coming is, is going to have a, a big impact. So one of the other things that we look at is, of course, demand and supply. So Supply, as in the growth of the new uh, hotels, the new rooms that are coming. So if you look at the last few years, 
it's been pretty, you know, pretty impressive, but it, percentage wise, that's not massive compared to, say, your, your Vietnam or your um, so in Middle Eastern markets, etc. But it's, it's stable and it keeps growing on an annual basis. And what you want is that dark blue line to always be above that. You want your demand growth to be above that. So you grow faster with the arrivals than you do with the, the new keys. But to the point when we had the, the, uh, the great new airport presentation, and everything, it's, it's hard. It's never going to go an even flow. You're always going to have this, there's, uh, like Mr. Afif was saying, there will be times where you will suffer, uh, where you need to dig in. Maldives have had for a long time more homogenic, where everyone was sitting, like, if I put all the hotels in my bucket, like, more ADR, more occupancy, moving around, what we've seen in the last couple of years is more some clear winners and some clear losers. So the operational excellence is playing a much bigger part now in the Maldives than I've ever seen before. You, everyone really needs to dig in and try and do, do the best they can. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk together, but I think today is a great sign that everyone should do, because we're all facing the same challenges. Um, so that balance there and that gap that was created in the last few years, uh, when demand growth was lower than supply growth for such a long time, clearly created what you just saw on that down uh, curve uh, earlier. I, I started also looking at absolute data. So this is the occupancy. Uh, it's a lot of squibbly graphs. But the point I'm trying to make here is that you can see how it, this, you know, I mean, you know seasonality is, you know, arguably bigger here than in Phuket, right? It's massive. A lot of, you know, big season versus And for me, as a foreigner who's only been a few times in Maldives, for me that's just, it doesn't make sense long term. Maldives off season, so called off season or peak season or shoulder, off season is fantastic. If it rains a bit and the, the surf breaks are even better, it's amazing. So hopefully one day people will get that and then come on the outside that season as well. But the one thing for me is you can see at the lower end, so the low season throughout the years, the winner there was the low season. Right? That was the one that gained, but the peak stayed the same. And there's some compression there, right? When you're up in your 85%, it's hard to grow occupancy. It's more about the rates, um, generally in the market. But it was the low season that was growing, and then now has come back to the earlier levels. In the rates, it's pretty much the same thing, where the peak season stayed uh, in the same rate band, but the lower season grew. All right? Low season, a little bit of shoulder, grew the rates. So what I'm thinking here is maybe there's an opportunity uh, in terms of yielding during compression. So we, we spent a lot of time recently in those, say, Tokyo, Oakland, uh, Sydney, Singapore, those more, and Hong Kong, those markets where they sit at 80-85% on an annual basis, constantly. It's hard to get a room and it's very expensive in those big cities. So how good is the market to cream more ADR out when occupancy is high, right? To do basic revenue management. Uh, so when I look at that, I'm seeing, yeah, there's a peak season, but it's not growing. So when, as you saw on the other chart, when occupancy is 85%, and every year it's the same rate, I'm thinking, well, could hoteliers in the Maldives, perhaps, when they know year after year, here's the peak, grow that peak ADR higher. So it's an open question that we'll get back to at the end of this. But I think that there might be an opportunity when I compare it to others. Look at Phuket. Phuket is a reasonable, especially in the luxury and upper upscale, so the top tier of hotels, similar situation. They are best in class in Asia when it comes to doing that. When Phuket has 85, 90% occupancy, they get over 50% higher rate than when the occupancy is below. So that over 50% higher rate when the occupancy is just below that 85%. There are many, uh, Singapore is, is typically quite crap at that. They actually uh, get 6 7% higher rate. So Singapore lacks that confidence to really crack that rate when occupancy is high. But whereas Phuket and Luxury uh, do a fantastic job of that. So maybe that is an opportunity uh, for them all these, uh, that I look at, the, at these numbers. But, the big question, of course, when is it all going to turn around? Now, based on all the factors we mentioned so far, I don't think it, it's not, you know, it isn't that classic cyclical behavior where it just comes back all in one go. You look at Thailand, who's one of the most resilient markets in the world. During the coup in 2014, 
It fell through the floor, the man went off, and no one went to Thailand. Nine months later, it was above 2013 levels. Nine months. Right? It's incredibly resilient, and it keeps growing. Bangkok first, and then Phuket, and Samoa in the other markets as well. So when is this going to turn? Well, if we look more recently then, this is by quarter. So the, the green little bars on the left is saying 2014 to 2017, the first quarter. And, but if we look at Captain America over to the right, the first sign of at least the stop loss was in Q4 last year, because the rev bar actually held up against the Q4 at 15. And that was the first quarter we've seen that in a long time. Well, a long time, three years, and a whole bunch of quarters. So that was the first time we saw it now that it held up. And it was the same thing then over in, in uh, this quarter now that ended in 2017. We're actually now seeing two quarters that were the same as before. So that's one, one, one sign you could argue of, of a little bit of, of, of uh, stop loss, perhaps. Um, if we look at the first quarter in occupancy, so occupancy did decline from uh, uh, last year in the first quarter, as you can see, but the rates were higher. So we got higher rates this quarter than quarter last year. So that's the first time again in a while that we're seeing some, a little bit of a comeback, and as a result, you got um, performance-wise, so rev par uh, actually better. Now, does that mean that everything is sugar dandy and we're gonna see fantastic results? And they didn't know. Let's keep your know, perspectives here, but it's not all doom and gloom, and I, when I've been presenting for two years, everyone says, oh, Maldives, down 13% and down 10%. There is now stopped a bit, so it's important to keep a, a perspective of what's been happening. I also want to highlight a bit of the weekdays, uh, because there's been a, a little bit of a shift and a fluctuation what's been happening there. In the, if you take up until end of March, those 12 months, and compared to the 12 months before that, uh, Wednesdays and Fridays did best. Right? They held the rates better than the other days. And then towards the weekend, Friday and Saturday, it was held up best. So the, the winner in this kind of was the Saturday that was a bit special because with this trend that Saturday held up better, Saturday is now the highest rate in, uh, in the data that we have from the Maldives. It's lower occupancy, yes, so during the weekend, but it's got the highest rate. So that's a shift and a change from, from the, last years, uh, the last few years as well that we've seen. Um, and if you look at just the, the quarter, you can see there was a shift. Is it the end of, of a potential decline? No, because you see Friday and Saturday, uh, the big difference from uh, this quarter to last quarter, and a lot of that is rates. Back at the, uh, the right-hand side, the weekend rate has declined again of, 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 uh, uh, in this quarter compared to last uh, quarter. So the, the question, of course, when statistically what I just showed you means that, well, hang on, so it's kind of, it's turning around, but it's not really soon, is it? Because there's a lot of rooms coming. Um, there's a big diversity of performance. We have some performance, and I know there's a the panel coming up talking about renovation and the importance of that as well. You know, and capturing the new guests and making repeat guests. So if we are able to build a few quarters where we stop loss and like the negative growth stops, I think that's a win to build up and set yourselves up for 2018, which is going to be a very critical year. But we have to keep perspective. I want to fly this. So we put this up on social media recently. Just We just took a snapshot. People were asking, like, New Year's Eve, um, uh, 10 big resort markets in Asia, which one has the highest rate? So that big wave up there is 1,400 US dollars. And down there, you have French Polynesia, Samoy, Okinawa, Fiji, Langkawi. It's just, it's a big difference. So don't forget that. I know it's, it's different sort of operationally and pro your overall GOP, what happens, but never forget that you have a totally different starting line and baseline compared to those competing markets that uh, people are looking And French Polynesia, now that's an isolated market, right? That's very, very far away. One thing I want to do is do a quick comparison um, with, with a few other markets. Um, so question is, these six pictures, who can tell me, who can tell me which these six markets are? There might be a prize. Mr. Afif, would you care to take a stab? What do you think? What do we got up here to the left? 
Or anyone. Do you see anyone there? Yeah, yeah, that would be Thailand. Where, where do you think? I'll give you, I'll give you the six names they are. That is French Paul. That's correct. That's Bora Bora, right there. What do you think, John? Bali. Yeah, that's Bali. Bali's temple right up there in the corner. That's right. We got two. Thank you. Thank you. That's a bit of a giveaway in the middle here. There's a lot of because if uh, yes, a lot of hits. That's Karen Beach Phuket. John Louis, you're on a roll. So we got Bora Bora. What do you think the top one in the middle is? There you go. I was waiting for you. Fiji, Bali, Indonesia. That's Kusamoy, Pattaya, and Phuket. Well, I did say prices. I do. I showed you. You get uh, the uh, first price there. You get the battery charger. Um, fan, uh, memory stick. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. You got to be priceless. If I ask you questions, I got to give some. So, we took these and got to compare in the last few years how it's been trending to give you a little bit of perspective. Um, so first, you got the Maldives. Maldives. You've you've seen this curve now a few times, up and a little bit of down. So I've based it on 2011 and what's been happening since then. So look at Fiji. Similar outcome, but a different journey there. You know, if it's been some cyclones and uh, different supply-demand balance, but it's a little bit of growth and now heading a bit in the you know, general direction. Uh, and I'd say the Fiji Hotel Association, which we work strongly with, uh, is, is coming together also with a strong voice now, which is clearly helping, which you guys are seeing as well. That's French Polynesia. Just how they've been trending in the last few years. Talk about an isolated market. So many factors behind this. One is actually exchange rate uh, that's been more favorable in the last 12 months for them. They found new source markets in North America and South America that they've never attracted before. The tourism board and the government has spent tons of money in attracting uh, uh, new visitors to uh, French Polynesia. So their trend, and this is likely to continue as well based on what we're seeing now and the new supply that is coming. So for the other, Bali, Samoy, Pattaya, and Phuket, it's only luxury and upper upscale to make a, some kind of comparison. Um, so that Bali and Samoy are kind of similar, Samoy a little bit more. Samoy's been able to capture the growth quicker uh, from the drop in 2014. So all these four Thai markets, of course, saw 2014 fall off, fall off and then come back very quickly. And then Pattaya and, and Phuket. I think Phuket is doing, Phuket ended up in that situation, as some of you who may have worked there, where the Russians just disappeared very quickly with the, the sanctions and everything. You only had the high net worth people that came, but most of the other disappeared. Um, but the Chinese came in so quickly, right? It wasn't just the Chiang Mai, but in Phuket, Chinese came in very quickly, and it changed, obviously, the, the length of stay and the, the net spend and then spend in the restaurants and everything, but it saved them. Right, so the Chinese saved them again, um, and now Russians are coming back in, but also about diversifying their, their business as well. So that gives you an idea. Now, this might look unfair. We say the Maldives at the bottom, and you know, compared to these. Now, I could put Seychelles and Mauritius in there. Mauritius, if that was in, would be below Maldives, and Seychelles, Seychelles even more below compared to 2011. So that's been trending down uh, more than the Maldives as well. So not worst in class at all um, from that perspective. And let's talk about pipeline. Uh, we mentioned the new uh, rooms that are coming. The big macro level uh, is that overall in Asia Pacific, of course the big countries, China, India, and Indonesia, has the most rooms, and most rooms are coming, uh, of course. Uh, Malaysia, Australia growing a bit as well, of course. Slowing down in the big countries, I mean, China is... Uh, you know, we're seeing things policy of, of not putting only luxury hotels in fourth tier cities that used to be in the past. So it's slowing down a little bit. Uh, but the big uh, investment focus in the last 12 to 18 months has been Vietnam for sure. The pace in the last 12 months, 65% more rooms planned just in the last 12 months. We have on our books 40% increase in rooms over what exists today. And it's all over the place. It's in the cities, Hanoi, Chimin, it's in Da Nang, it's all over the place. It's in domestic brands, 
It's in international, from economy to luxury. And the money's coming from many different places as well. And as you see, if you look at Vietnam, infrastructure, airlift, airports, everything they're doing at the moment is a lot of countries are looking at it, investors are liking it, it's less opportunistic. Now, no one is saying that Vietnam doesn't have any corruption. Anyone who's ever dealt with Vietnam knows that there are issues that they are, need to work on and need to fix. This is happening though, and as long as that money keeps feeding and feeding off the infrastructure, we expect these numbers to continue. With all this new supply, they certainly need the performance to grow as it does today, which is uh, clearly important. Now, Sri Lanka is a great example as well. Uh, now, uh, just a few years after the war and really growing quickly, trying to uh, attract new investment uh, into the country as well. And, and s similar position as Vietnam in terms of the infrastructure needed to, to get more and the airport uh, improvements as well. Now, overall in Asia Pacific, upper upscale and upscale. So the two classes that are just under luxury are still where most of the tells are going to come across the entire region. Right, 28 and 29 percent. The biggest shift we've seen in the last 12 months is that less luxury and upscale, but more upper mid scale. So more investors are, and owners are looking to do upper mid scale. 100, 150 keys, that kind of upper mid scale. The, well, yeah, it depends on the country. That's why we don't do star ratings. So you're three and a half star, three star kind of properties. More than we saw two, three years ago. Is there luxury being planned? Absolutely, you can see it in your country here. But there is more upper mid-scale and uh, properties being planned moving forward. Um, so back to the Maldives and the pipeline. In our books, we have 9% opening next year. 9% of new rooms compared to what exists today. And as you mentioned, there's, there's a lot of rooms. I agree with any more. If you look at Singapore, uh, Singapore has six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 keys in a couple of years. That's a lot in a small country like Singapore. Singapore has shared something with the Maldives in that it's very dependent on international arrivals. Singapore plans 15, 20 years ahead, a new terminal, new airport and everything. It needs that to grow. So a couple of years ago when Singapore arrivals started to decline a bit and all these keys were planned, Singapore has had negative growth in Revpar now for a while. Uh, it didn't have the courage to tweak the rates I mentioned earlier. So it's been a challenge for Singapore, but long term they need it, because their plan is to reach you know, 10 million arrivals and everything. And if Maldives have an ambition to handle seven and a half, eight million people at the airport, to reach two or three million arrivals every year, if that ambition is there, of course their tourism are needed. But to, to Mr. Habib's point, this is not going to be a nice, smooth, steady ride. So it is getting into, so I don't want to sell an over-positive message that we're out of a, a vicious cycle of decline. We saw that stop loss, perhaps, but 2018 is going to be an interesting year where operational excellence is needed. So some of my summary points would be that we're happy to see that travel is growing at least. There is a backbone. Investment from uh, governments and tourism boards to attract people from new source markets is absolutely critical. Um, uh, it's encouraging and impressive to see that diversification coming in the Maldives, gaining growth from many other markets, 15 out of 20, including Sweden. Yes, uh, we're happy to come. Uh, could there maybe be some more yielding against the, in the high compression days? Is it end of a cycle, more in a stop loss because of the rooms they have that are coming? So those are uh, probably some of the key summary points that I had uh, from the data that I've seen. And there's, there's so many ways you can break and, and slice and break up this data points, but those are the, the main points that I was uh, uh, keen to, to look at. Uh, if we have time for a couple of questions, do we? Um, one thing I was keen to ask, because you guys are the ones with the, the operational uh, qualities, um, I, I, I was curious, uh, and I, maybe I'll pick on you, Sean, because I was uh, by your property yesterday. So, uh, I went, so, the hotel here is, is fantastic, a, a, a great hospitality that took care of me yesterday. I had two hours to kill, so I went out and uh, played with some fish, as you do uh, in Maldives, and did some uh, snorkeling around b b behind your property. And two ladies joined me, uh, a mother and a daughter. She lived in New York, and her mother lived in Brazil. So they traveled 37 hours with a 12-hour layover, and their entire holiday, 12 days, you know, that's all they get in the U.S., so their entire holiday and tons of money to go to the Maldives which is just fantastic, right? 
uh, just speaks volumes to what you have built and what this country is capable of attracting them. So I asked them, obviously, well, you, would you consider coming back? We want repeat customers coming as well. I was like, yeah, probably they had a good experience. But when you now have that, do you think, am I right or wrong in saying that there is an opportunity to increase the rates during nice high occupancy uh, when it didn't move earlier? Do you think that that could be done more? resort being built mm. and most of them are going to be, you know, certain category. Yeah. Whereas the demand whatsoever is, I would say, is going to be the mid-level people. Mm. So we are we are dealing with a lot of middle class operators and we see what they want. Mm. It's like an aircraft operating, you have the first class, you have the business class, you have the economy. But we have been riding on this image of this being a very high high destination and the myth has gone that even the people who want to come say, look, this is too expensive, we don't want to look at it. This is, I think, something we have to be very careful now that a lot of beds are coming. I can say very well, you know, this, the, the question will come when this lot of new hotels with the very high income, there will be a, there will be a price war among the big people first. Mm. There will be a price war there for sure about it. Next, it will flicker down, down the line to everybody. Because in Maldi you now there are three tier system of hotel rooms. One is the very top end, mm. then the newcomers, then we have the middle level people who are, you know, basically the uh, wholesalers who are operating in Europe, in China. Then we have the guest house market, which mm. is also eating into every aspect of the rooms. So we are now, you know, going to, going to go through a new face of this adjustment, I would say, is for some time to come. And Can I say something? Please. Uh, I, I also think it is uh, important to, uh, to, to note what, what, has had, what has taken place. Uh, quite a number of our resorts who were, especially in the middle end of the market, all within a period of 10 to 15 years, have moved into the high end. The reason was because of the policy of bidding process. It was the 60% mark that you get f to win a, a resort that drove the whole thing up. As a result, everybody was moving towards the five-star bracket, which meant new, new resorts as well as existing ones all moved into the high-end sector, thereby leaving the mid middle to lower and completely uh, unavailable for, for the charter market. So there was a big imbalance here. The reason was because of these policies. Uh, you know, we should have a more central policy to plan something out. I think this is something that we should recognize. So therefore, I thought it is important to, to, to remember that while we are talking about that. Thank you. Uh, but what about the... Um, so the mix of the, the channels are together, right? So wholesale still has, you know, a, a part of the business, but the OTAs keep growing and, and, and the GDA. So there's a difference because some of these channels you affect more than, than others. So if you look at, uh, is this room a concerned one or a neutral or a, a less concerned one when it comes to the OTAs and using them more into coming to the Maldives? All those of you who are concerned about the growth of OTAs in the Maldives, raise a hand, please. So not so much concern. Now, I mean, because I, am I right in understanding in this not super empirical data, but it feels like on average what I've been hearing, so it sounds like Fox News, what I'm hearing is like 30, 35% OTA on average in a hotel. Too high, too low? Much higher. Lower. Okay. So, which, 
clearly there's a room, you know, you go in a lot of other Asian markets, you go to Europe, 50, 60 percent driven by OTA. And the OTA also tells everyone, they're like, oh, the OTAs are horrible, I need to fix my brand or comb and everything. The Maldives is obviously a, a different destination, but it's the same when you compare it to French Polynesia and, and, and other markets that rely on these channels very well. Um, and I would argue OTAs then have a, have a smaller share here than comparatively to, to other other markets. And that's a rate where you could, um, that's a channel where you could influence and, and yield, I suppose, a little bit more. Any questions on, on the data I have? I, I appreciate that I've, I've run out of time. Yes, please. I just, I just, uh, do you have anything on uh, dual? Sorry. And do you have anything on uh, dual destinations in the region? On? On dual destination like, like Maldives and maybe a nearby one? Oh, like uh, when you uh, do a stay yeah. in Sri Lanka for a few uh, weeks. Now, it, it's an interesting point that we talked about before this uh, started as well. With that increase, um, we should do some more analysis around it. Because people, if you look at if someone who would travel from the US, and if that's channel increasing, that source market, and if they go on a Middle Eastern airline, they would go and stay in Dubai for a number of hours instead. Um, but it certainly seems like it's increasing into uh, combining a holiday exactly to the point of saying like, well, I can't, put all my, I can't go to the Maldives for that long. I can't go to, it, other, with other high-end destinations as well. So maybe I'll go a more affordable market like Sri Lanka in the beginning. So uh, we haven't presented something yet, but I, I definitely want to do that because you can tie that in with some uh, flight data and see uh, total itinerary and stuff. So thank you for that. We will. I think we haven't tapped into the budget uh, people of the uh, of the markets that we are catering to. Mm. We don't tap into the budget people. No. No. We don't. And that's, uh, that is a market that we could tap into these additional bits that are coming in. But can, so how quickly do you think that mindset, because around the world, the Maldives is known for this luxury. The honeymoon. It's still known as the honeymoon and, and that and yes. super high end. Can you be can you can you be both? Yes. Yeah? And can and the Maldives be both? Yeah, people why we can be both is because every island is a, a, a resort by itself. Mm. So one doesn't know where the, what the other is having, no. you know. That's what that's what one reason. It's like when tsunami came. Yes. One many islands didn't know the tsunami had come to the other islands. You know, it, it's not like in Sri Lanka where you went, you saw you know, even you were even if you were staying in a, a hotel mm. which was not affected by yeah. you could see through the window the disaster that has happened uh, hundred meters away yeah, you know? this is true. so but in Maldives it was not like that yeah. you know? so I think like for example if you go into Europe and you ask hundred people uh, have you been to Maldives or they will say it's too expensive yes. So these hundred people we can tap. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I mean. No, I agree. So it is an uptime market, and it doesn't have to be people. It doesn't have to be backpackers. It doesn't have to be no. the, 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 the the upper mid scale that I was talking about, right? The people that they don't mind spending a bit to go to this wonderful country, but it's not the high end. I agree. No, no. I mean, if even if they have to pay the cost of their living yeah. in their country within those fourteen days, yeah, it will still be a good price for us. Absolutely. <laughs> So what, what does it matter whether yeah. they're there or here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? No. And that's part of that growth of going that's beyond right. two million. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I think, you know, in Maldives, we will have to change, you know, our slogan. We have to say that affordable luxury. You know, something that gives an opening for the commandment to come, that he is no more to say that I shun off. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, branding-wise, that I know what you mean, and affordable luxury, and I mean, and the hotel space, that's, for instance, what uh, you have, uh, uh, what are they called? The, the Dutch hotel company that do, you know, like 11 square meter rooms, uh, because, and, but very small, but, but uh, supposedly high-end. And then, you know, affordable luxury, even Yotel is, is kind of claiming going that. So, but that's something different. But I, I know what you mean. That to say, like, no, no, it might be luxury, it might be that. And you, the chart I had with the high wave, the rates here are higher today. But the more products you introduce, and of course with the OTAs that are very good at finding that kind of customer for you, um, uh, that particular customer, um, there should be a good opportunity to do that.
Absolutely, and you need, you need, Maldives needs it for, for the future, because it cannot only be one type of customer, absolutely. Thank you. And it, well, I'm, I'm, we're available today, obviously, just be for any other questions as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.